With my father, the forester Peter Mikhailovich Baikov, we often spent nights in the wilderness. During those nights by the campfire, my father would tell me many interesting things. These stories were heard by me many times, but there was one story that my father entrusted to me only once and never repeated again. The First Encounter It was January in the distant 70s of the last century. My father had a license to hunt moose, but the winter was extremely cold. The snowy blanket crackled under the skis of the tracker, spreading a creaking sound far into the forest, warning and scaring the animals. Getting closer to them within shooting distance was practically impossible. The hunter had already spent more than a day in the taiga. Sometimes he would return to the city for a short rest, and then he would head out to hunt again a day or two later. January days were short, and it got dark early. The father had spent several nights in a residential dugout. There were at least two dozen such dugouts in the area. The father usually set up these temporary shelters in the abandoned coal pits. The dugout's walls were made of freshly cut logs. The roof was covered with birch bark sheets. The benches were made of poles and the stove was made of clay. As time went on, the forest dwelling was equipped with an iron stove, sleeping mats filled with dry sedge, and other useful items. A small resinous knot in the stove would last all night, providing the necessary warmth. To conserve heat, Father usually didn't make doors but preferred to have a small opening at the entrance to the dwelling covered with a shutter. One night in one of these forest nights, Father got up to relieve himself. The match he lit showed four o'clock in the morning. It's still early. The lodger sighed and opened the dugout shutter. He looked out, and there in the night frosty haze, a large animal standing on its hind legs appeared before his eyes. A bear, the hunter exhaled. He didn't even realize from sleep that the master of the forest was peacefully licking its paw in a secluded den in these January colds. In the darkness, Father involuntarily felt for the gun and fired a shot directly at the silhouette of the beast from the dugout window. The animal didn't even flinch, although its size was striking. Standing on its legs, it was at least three meters tall. I couldn't have missed, Father said. The animal was only seven or eight meters away. Recharging the gun, the hunter looked out of the dwelling. The clumsy-looking animal, standing on its own, full height, was moving away into the thicket. It was already 50 meters away. Shooting through the dense bushes was pointless. In the morning, Father found a small aspen twig cut by the night bullet and a few black hairs near the shelter. Apparently, the bullet ricocheted off the aspen twig and tore out these hairs from the animal's skin, thus saving the life of the snowman, as my father later assured me it was. Apparently, Father had further encounters with this creature. Father often went into the forest to spend the night in a forest hut, claiming that he had a headache. In the forest, there is silence, fresh air, peace, earthly paradise, he would say. There must have been something drawing Father into the taiga. There was some spiritual connection with the world of forest animals. Father emerged from the forest, revitalized, capable of moving mountains. Could it be that he was the Yeti's forest spiritual guide? Meeting second. This story of my father's meeting with the Yeti had a continuation, but with me. About ten years had passed since the first meeting of my father with the Yeti. In those years, local residents would rush into the surrounding forests, swamps, and fields after work to gather medicinal herbs, rowan berries, rose hips, chaga mushrooms, berries, and mushrooms. And in the morning, it was back to work. All the gifts of nature were laid out on the family table for meals, and any excess was sold to collection points for extra money, making life easier for the citizens of the periphery. I was also infected with the fever of gathering gifts from the forest. One gray and rainy October weekend, I wandered through the distant swamps of the Turpanovo Ravine, picking rare cranberries. Soon, I grew tired of this activity. The berries in my basket were quiet, and I decided to head towards the cranberry spots. I reached the old forest clearings. I saw tall green mounds. These were stumps from cut-down trees covered over time with thick dark green moss. And in this moss, crimson clusters of cranberries were hidden. So large that the berries couldn't all fit on one hand, I had to use my other hand. My work was interrupted. My two-bucket container was almost full, and I decided to take a break. I got up, looked around. Oh, these were familiar places. According to the signs, my father's dugout should be nearby where we had spent many a stormy night. I need to stretch my legs and at the same time visit the dwelling, I decided, leaving the heavy basket and backpack behind, hanging a bright rag on a high branch as a marker, I set off towards the dugout. 
and there it was. Carefully stepping, looking around with a sense of unease, I approached the dwelling. I could see that the door to the hut was slightly ajar. Over time, my father had attached hinges to the shutter, turning it into a full-fledged door. I observed. The birch twig that used to prop the door was now neatly placed against the cabin wall. I stood for a moment. All was quiet around me. I cautiously opened the door of the dwelling and, oh horror, a human-like creature stared at me up close. Black hairy with small round ears, bright bulging shiny eyes in the darkness. The creature's legs paws dangled from the seat it was sitting on. The animal resembled a baby bear, but bears don't sit like that. The moments of this vision were vividly etched into my mind. Unconsciously, instinctively, I slammed the entrance to the hut shut and immediately started running without looking back at the bright rag marker. In my backpack pocket were some matches and birch bark, which I quickly ignited and began waving around me like a torch, burning and emitting a pungent smell of smoke and fire as a beacon. This was a hot ritual taught to me by my father to ward off wild predatory forest animals. Some time passed. The torch burned out. No one was chasing after me. The fear gradually left me, but for safety, I sometimes tapped the thick pine with the blunt edge of my small axe, which I always carried in the forest to cut down medicinal chaga mushrooms. I refrained from singing and shouting so as not to attract further trouble like meeting the little yeti's parents. I gathered my basket and headed home. I didn't tell my parents about the encounter in the hut. I kept this secret until this publication. Meeting third. Another indirect fact that speaks of the Yeti visiting the Turpanovo Ravine, about 15 kilometers from Solvichagodsk, is another incident. These places used to be remote, impassable, with predatory animals before land reclamation and continuous deforestation. In those extreme conditions in those times, mushroom pickers and berry pickers often got lost in the surrounding forests. Helicopters were even flown to look for the missing. I will highlight only one case in which I was involved. That year I had finished sixth grade, and my father and I went to harvest hay. A hay field was allocated to us along the marshy stream of the Alina River. At that time, my father was given a service moped as a forester, and every day during the haymaking season I rode back and forth for about 10 kilometers on rough terrain. My mother, Anna Fedorovna, took the cow to pasture at six in the morning, waking me before that. I fueled the moped and raced to help my father. In the evening, I returned home to help my mother with the livestock, household chores, watering, and weeding the garden beds. And my father stayed in the forest overnight. He built another dugout next to the hayfield and spent the night there. During this haymaking time, a man went missing. He had gone into the forest with his bicycle, presumably to pick mushrooms or berries and disappeared. More than a week had passed since this incident. The sons of the missing man, Nikolai Borisovich Vygodnikov, waited for me in their parents' home in the evening. I served as the intermediary between my father and them. My father drew maps of the forested areas on the pages of a school notebook as a memento, showing where to look for the missing man. After studying this note, the Vygodnikov brothers and all those involved in the search for Nikolai Borisovich combed the designated areas in groups. One Friday arrived. My father and I worked hard that day. The heat, clouds of horseflies and deer flies accelerated our work. After lunch, thunder rumbles were heard in the distance. I rushed to gather the last stacks of hay before the rain and was stopped by a shout from the other side of the stream. A ragged man with a gaunt face was yelling at me. Are you human? Save me! Upon closer inspection, I recognized the traveler. It was Nikolai Borisovich, the man who had gone missing in the forest. I was overjoyed. The traveler kept repeating, Are you human? Real humans? Where is that black hairy man who led me here? Nikolai Borisovich approached us. We gave him some tea. Soon my father gave me the command. Get on the moped, head to town before the cars with the search teams disappear in the woods. I hurried to the road and soon saw the first searchers descending from a high plateau towards me. Through the wind and thunderous roars, I informed them of the discovery of the missing man. They were relieved and sent a signal flare into the sky, a sign to the others. Stop searching. But it was more of a celebratory shot than a signal. A dark cloud was already looming over us and a downpour was imminent. I've seen a lot in my life, 
Grandpa Evzich said thoughtfully. Some things have faded from my memory, as if shrouded in fog. I can only remember them in pieces, and there are things that stand before my eyes, as if it happened yesterday as scary as it was back then. We sat down for a modest breakfast early in the morning in the hunting lodge. The cold November night still reigned over the taiga, and it was even more cozy in the room, warmed from the night with a cup of hot tea in hand, listening to the chatter of the old hunter. And he could tell a story. And it seemed to us tough materialistic adults that he was also lying a bit. But the details in which he described certain events blurred the line between reality and something mystical beyond our understanding. So there was the same weather back then. If Sayich continued, taking a sip from the cup, I had just turned 12. It was a cold autumn. We hadn't seen the sun in a while. Our village mainly lived on fishing. The fishermen lived, but there were also hunters. Three men. The village was supplied with game. People started to disappear then. First one of the hunters, Sava disappeared in the forest, then Lukeria, Nikodimov's wife, along with her daughter, didn't return from the forest. And then when Stepan Pantelev disappeared, that's when we really started to worry. And at that time, a wanderer came to our village. A famous hunter and tracker named Egal, whether Chukchi or someone else I don't remember. But there were legends about him. They told a lot of things I've forgotten already. So he heard about our affairs and got very angry. I'll die, he says. But I'll find out who's messing around here. Egal settled in our barn. He refused to live in the lodge despite my father's persuasions. And he disappeared for days and nights in the taiga. He would come, rest, eat, and then disappear again. And one morning, Agal came out of the forest and ordered all the men to gather. Everyone gathered, and the hunter said, It's a bad business. The Yeti came indeed. It was very difficult to track him. His sense of smell any beast would envy. But I found his den, and there were a lot of bones, and something else was there. With these words, the tracker pulled out a smoking pipe from his pocket. Everyone recognized Stepan Pantelev's pipe, who had disappeared two weeks ago. I saw him myself, Nigel continued. Twice, but from afar. Clever indeed. But I know how to outwit him. We need to rest. I will prepare. I will take him. He probably slept for a whole day. Then he fiddled with his simple equipment for a long time. By evening, Igel set off into the forest. And he disappeared. He only appeared on the third day. Exhausted and torn, blood-stained clothes, all bruised, Igal emerged from the forest, leaning on a stick. The men ran out to meet him, picked him up, carried him to the lodge, treated his wounds, and laid him down on the bed. After resting, the tracker ate and told his adventures. It was very difficult, but I lured the forest man to me for fifty steps and shot him. He let out a scream, but not a human one. It was as if a bear roared through the whole taiga. And staggering, he started running. I chased him. But the monster tricked me. It set up an ambush itself. While I followed the trail, the forest man circled and ended up behind me. He pounced from behind, dug his claws into my shoulders. I pulled out my knife and struck blindly several times. The grip loosened. I started to fall. And turning around, I raised my gun and shot in front of me. I fell, and the monster's body pinned me to the ground. He was very heavy. I thought I would suffocate. I barely managed to get out from under him. His eyes were like a terrible abyss, Igal continued. They sparkled with bright flames, filling me with horror. And he ran so easily, as if flying above the ground, leaving only blood traces behind. I kept shooting, but the killer turned into a snow vortex and disappeared before my eyes. Hunter Agal decided to take three hunters with him to help him hunt the Yeti. He chose the most experienced, those who knew how to shoot, from the village, Vasily, Stepan, and Vladimir. Before heading into the forest, Igal explained that the Yeti was very dangerous and cunning. He warned the hunters that they needed to be prepared for anything, and that the killer could turn into anything to avoid danger. The hunters carefully prepared for the hunt. They checked their rifles, sharpened their knives, and when everything was ready, they set off into the mysterious taiga, following the tracks of the yeti that led them to its lair. They were prepared to meet the unknown, their hearts beating faster with excitement and fear. But they were determined and ready to face the challenge. They hid in the bushes near the entrance to the cave, holding their rifles at the ready and listening intently for any sound. In the depths of their souls, they knew that the encounter with the yeti could end in either success or tragedy. Minutes passed slowly and the wind whispered its mysterious stories, reminding them of the vastness of the taiga and its recent victims. Six hours had passed since the hunters had laid in wait, 
but there was no movement at the entrance to the cave. Igal silently stood up and said they needed to retreat to eat and regain strength. They understood that they could not afford to lose vigilance and agreed with his proposal. They returned to the village to have a snack and rest. Sitting at the table, they discussed their next steps. Igal suggested returning to the lair in a few hours when it got dark, as then the Yeti would be active and ready to hunt. When the evening twilight fell, the hunters set off into the taiga once again, and there they were, back in position, hiding in ambush near the cave. Their hearts beat even faster than before, and their gazes were fixed on the entrance where the Yeti could appear. Friends, today we must be on high alert. Hunter Vasily began the conversation. The Yeti has a cunning touch, and we need to be attentive from all sides. Yes, I agree, added Hunter Stefan. It's a dangerous creature, and we need to be attentive from all sides. At that moment, Hunter Vladimir confessed, Friends, I have to admit that I am very afraid. I don't know if I can stand up to this monster. Don't worry, Vladimir, Igal reassured him. We are all together, and we can do it. It's important to keep a cool head and act in unison. Everything will be fine. The hunters focused once again on the entrance to the cave, ready to meet the Yeti at any moment. Their determination was real, and they were ready to fight to the end. They heard a muffled growl coming from inside the cave, and their hearts froze with fear. But they were determined, and despite their fear, they emerged from their ambush and cautiously approached the cave entrance. It was dark inside, but they heard rustling and heavy breathing. Igal was the first to enter the cave, with his rifle at the ready. The hunters followed him, tension reaching its peak. They moved forward slowly, examining every corner, ready for any unexpected turn of events. The cave smelled awful. The stench of decay and decomposition permeated their existence. They were staggered by this foul odor, but they had to endure it to move forward. Suddenly, a creature leaped out of the darkness. It was huge, covered in fur, with red eyes filled with rage and aggression. Its huge fangs glistened in the torchlight that Igal held in his hand. The creature latched onto the leg of terrified Vladimir, its claws digging into flesh, causing sharp pain. The hunters were paralyzed with fear, but Igal was quick and decisive. Sweeping the creature off Vladimir, he shot his rifle straight into the heart of the Yeti. It let out a mighty roar and fell to the ground, writhing in pain. The hunters descended upon it with their knives, delivering blows until the creature stopped moving. Together, they managed to kill the Yeti and rid themselves of its threat. After the difficult struggle with the Yeti, wounded and exhausted, the hunters barely made it back to the village. At first, the villagers didn't believe the hunters' words, dismissing their story as a frightening fairy tale. But when they saw the broken and lifeless body of the Yeti, there was no doubt about the truth of the tale. The villagers were amazed by this unusual find and thanked the hunters for saving their lives. The hunters decided not to leave the Yeti's body in plain sight to avoid panic among the villagers. They gathered firewood and created a bonfire to destroy the creature's body. The flames quickly engulfed the Yeti's body, and the horrific smell of decay gave way to the smell of burning flesh. When the fire completely consumed the Yeti's body, the hunters set out to find a place to bury the remains of the creature. They found a deep pit in the taiga, where they buried the creature's body and covered the pit with earth. Alex was a student at a well-known university on the outskirts of the state. He studied at the history faculty. He was very interested in various stories and legends. He even belonged to a club of young scholars. Together with other students like him, he traveled to various corners not only of the state but also of the country, collecting different legends and stories. The club was very popular and many students attended it. One day, a professor suggested that Alex go to a small fishing village to visit an old friend of his as he might have an interesting story to tell. Perhaps the story of the fisherman will catch the interest of other professors, and the article he will write about this man's story could become a scientific work. After all, none of Alex's other stories had been noticed yet. Taking his notebook, laptop, and camera, Alex got on a bus and set off in search of stories. The fisherman turned out to be a tall man with gray hair and a very friendly smile. Alex began to ask if he had any interesting stories, and one was found. The fisherman told him that he had seen a yeti. At first, Alex didn't believe him at all and thought that this trip had been a waste of time. But the man took an album off the shelf and showed him photographs of tracks they had seen in the mountains with his friends. Seeing such tracks in the photos, Alex became very keen on this story. 
The man told them that once he and his friends decided to go to the mountains to test themselves. When they had walked half their way through the snowy mountains, they noticed strange and very unusual tracks. The tracks didn't resemble those of a bear or a wolf. They looked like nothing they had ever seen before. They also heard strange sounds coming from afar, and as the fisherman claimed, only he was able to see the creature in the distance, which everyone called a yeti. Thanking the fisherman for the story, Alex headed home. On the way home, he didn't really believe that the fisherman had seen the yeti, but he had seen the photos of the tracks with his own eyes, and suddenly an idea popped into his head. What if he went on a quest for this creature himself? What if luck smiled upon him, and then his work would be noticed not only by the university, but by the whole world? Alex had a friend named Jacob and a friend named Lily. They had known each other since their first year. They were all into mountaineering. The friends didn't want to agree to this trip for a long time. In the mountains, Lily and Jacob felt at home, but something still held them back from this adventure. They were skeptical and said that Alex had simply gone crazy, but Alex kept insisting and begging his friends because for him, this trip could change everything. Alex said that they would definitely find the Yeti and that when they returned home, their lives would change dramatically. He told them stories of people who had encountered the snowman. After some time and countless pleas from his friend, they finally agreed to the trip. The fear was great, but the opportunity to see this creature with their own eyes outweighed the fear. But Lily had one condition. For the first two days, they would gather local legends and myths about this creature. So the friends decided to go to the Himalayas. They were lucky, as winter break was starting in two weeks, and they would have enough time to prepare for the trip. At times, the friends were not enthusiastic about this venture anymore. They wanted to back out, but the tickets had already been booked. They had little equipment, so they decided to buy most of it on site. The day of the trip was very nerve-wracking for the friends. The flight went smoothly, and everyone's mood was great. They arrived for a whole week, and they decided to spend the first few days exploring the local legends and myths about encountering the Yeti. Alex could already imagine how they would first see the tracks and then the Yeti itself be able to photograph it, and then his work would be noticed. Arriving at the location, a bus was already waiting for them, which took them to the hotel. The company booked the hotel only for a few days, as they would need to head to nearby villages from early in the morning to interact with the local residents. Welcome to the Himalayan Retreats, a luxurious hotel located on the slopes of the majestic Himalayas. This unique hotel offers a combination of refined elegance and warm hospitality, making it the perfect place to relax after long days of exploration and adventure. That is the inscription that the guys were greeted with at the entrance to the hotel. Surrounded by dense forests and snow-capped peaks, the hotel offers stunning views of the valleys and glaciers, creating an impression of complete seclusion and harmony with nature. All the rooms and suites in the hotel are equipped with large panoramic windows, so guests can enjoy views of the Himalayas right from their rooms. The hotel was so beautiful that the guys simply didn't have enough words to describe it. The city itself was filled with various kiosks and souvenir shops with Yeti-themed items. Lily didn't like this much. She was sure that this place was just an entertainment for tourists. Alex reassured her and said that they would head to the mountains not from this city. They would depart from another place, approximately 50 kilometers away from this town, where the fisherman and his company left. Lily was relieved by this news. They managed to gather interesting notes about the local folklore and took many pictures of the breathtaking landscape. The next day, they headed to the base camp where they were greeted by a local guide named Tenzing, who told them about an ancient legend of the Yeti, a creature inhabiting the mountains. According to him, though many tried to encounter the Yeti, only few returned with confirmation of its existence. This story only fueled their curiosity. Early morning at the base camp at the foot of the Himalayas, the air was fresh and cool, and the first rays of the sun began to penetrate through the thick leaves of the trees. The group of student researchers prepared for their long-awaited mountain hike. Fear, slight excitement, intense interest, all these emotions were experienced by the guys right now. Lily checked the backpacks to make sure everyone had the necessary items. Warm clothes, spare socks, hats, and gloves. She also checked the walkie-talkies and satellite phone to stay in touch in case of an emergency. Jacob inspected the tents and sleeping bags, making sure they were in good condition and ready to use. He also checked the GPS navigators and compasses to not stray from the path. Alex checked his photography equipment. 
cameras, lenses, spare batteries, and memory cards, reviewed the maps and routes to make sure they knew the way and all the key points on the route, also reminded everyone of safety rules in the mountains, not to stray far from the group, monitor weather conditions, and be prepared for any unexpected situations. Alex held a brief briefing, reminding everyone of the importance of teamwork and supporting each other, sharing his knowledge of the local flora and fauna for everyone to know what to expect and what to pay attention to, inspiring everyone by showing his previous photos of the mountains and talking about the unique shots they could take on this hike, telling interesting stories and legends about the Himalayas to lift spirits and prepare everyone for the adventure, setting off. When all preparations are complete, the students put on their backpacks and line up. Alex leads the way, setting the pace, while Jacob brings up the rear, making sure no one falls behind. Lily walks in the middle, ready to capture interesting moments at any time, as well as keeping the maps and compasses handy. With the first steps on the trail, they feel their hearts fill with excitement and anticipation. Ahead of them lie many trials and discoveries, but they are ready for it. The Himalayas are calling, and they eagerly respond to this call, embarking on new adventures and unforgettable experiences. It was the second day of their trek through the Himalayas. Alex, Jacob, and Lily, despite their tiredness, were full of enthusiasm and determination. They had already seen many amazing landscapes and gathered valuable data for their research. But ahead of them awaited something completely unexpected. Early in the morning after a quick breakfast, the students began the ascent up another hill. The weather was clear, and the sun was slowly rising above the horizon, casting a golden hue on the snowy peaks. Alex walked ahead, carefully following the map and route. Jacob walked behind, checking for animal tracks. And Lily, as always, was ready to capture every moment on her camera. When they reached the top of the hill, they were met with a view of a small valley surrounded by dense forest. Suddenly, Jacob noticed something strange in the distance. He stopped and pointed towards the movement among the trees. Guys, look over there, he exclaimed, pointing towards the forest. Everyone froze. Lily raised her camera and tried to capture the moving figure in her lens. After a few seconds, they saw a huge shadow flickering among the trees. It could be a yeti, whispered Alex, unable to believe his eyes. The creature seemed to be moving slowly and cautiously, as if watching them. It was huge, covered in thick brown fur with a silvery sheen with powerful arms and legs. Its claws were massive, and its footprints were very large, just like those in fishermen's photographs. Its face was partially hidden, but its eyes shone with curiosity. They began to slowly descend into the valley, trying not to make any unnecessary noise. When they got closer, the Yeti stopped and turned towards them. Seeing the people, the creature made an incomprehensible sound and began to quickly move away from the group. Trembling with excitement, Lily took several shots. The students stood still for some time, trying to comprehend what had just happened. Back at the camp, they excitedly discussed the encounter. Lily's photos confirmed their story, but each of them knew that even without them, they would never forget this moment. When Alex returned home, he decided to publish his article about the Yeti, along with the photos. However, the professors were divided into two camps. Some believed the young man, while others did not. But for Alex, that was no longer important. He knew for sure that the Yeti, or the snowman, exists. The rest can believe it or not.